Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining this evening. I'm Georgia Krista, Tax Events Coordinator, and we are very happy to have this evening with us Corey Ruller to present her talk, Embodied Wisdom. As a conservation architect myself, I am very preoccupied by sustainable methods of improving the old building's energy performance while not destroying their heritage value during the process. Understanding the way in which the traditional buildings have been designed, the behavior of the fabric or their direct interaction with the local environment should always be the starting point in devising the best methods of retrofitting them. The use of mechanical means of environment management maybe should be ideally used just to boost the intrinsic qualities of those buildings in a hybrid system. The historic traditional buildings are offering us a great learning opportunity and if we are aware and recognize the huge amount of wisdom and inventiveness embedded in their design and fabric or their position in the landscape of the urban fabric we will be very lucky. Nowadays we are too keen on applying standardized solutions of mechanical environment management when designing a new building disregarding the context specific climate and the location of the buildings or the traditional building materials, or the local character, all of them resulting from centuries of trials and adaptations. We tend to ignore the great knowledge of our ancestors who understood and used the local advantages and limitations, and masterfully develop strategies of working together with and not against nature when designing the buildings. Corey's talk this evening will help us better understanding this embedded wisdom of old buildings by showing us a global survey of multiple examples to illustrate each environmental concept. In this way, offering us a set of inspirational strategies to be used in designing of sustainable new traditional buildings. We present, present you Corey Rollard a bit. Corey it's a New York-based preservation architect at Hanson Architecture and an active advocate for climate leadership for preservation. Her award-winning work has included the restoration of significant historic buildings, new construction in historical context and work in unusual circumstances, including full building relocation and reassembly from previously disassembled components. In the office and in her professional outreach, she promotes technical guidance for the appropriate care of existing buildings to both protect our cultural heritage and meet our carbon mitigation targets. She's a frequent speaker on topics, including tools for sustainable preservation, the wisdom of vernacular design and the urgent need for the continued use of our built heritage. I would like to hand over to Corey now, but before reminding you that the talk will be followed by a session of questions and answers. If you have questions during the talk, please type your questions on the message bar at the bottom of the screen. And after the talk, I will invite you to unmute your microphone and ask directly your questions. The TAP talks will take a break on August, but we will be back in September with a very interesting talk delivered by Ettore Mazzola from Notre Dame University, Rome Gateway. Watch this space for more details. I am handing over to Corey now and I will ask her to share her screen. Okay, you can see my screen now? Yes, very well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Georgia, and hello everyone. It's such a delight to join you today. I'm joining you from my office in New York City, where for the last two weeks, we've had a heat wave with daily high temperatures at or above 30 degrees Celsius with high humidity. The conditions have been tropical, bolstered in part by the remnants of Hurricane Barrel, the earliest forming Category 5 hurricane on record to have hit the Caribbean before dissipating northward. And while I'm very grateful to be joining you from an air-conditioned office, I'm not so grateful that that air conditioning has been so necessary lately. But it seems a fitting context for our conversation today as we all grapple with the physical realities of our changing and warming climate. 
and it's a and it's a fitting context to introduce a concept that is a, that is an important part of climate leadership through conservation and through a heritage conservation approach to our built environment. By now, I'm sure you're quite aware of the big picture imperative to address the climate crisis, including through our built environment. That these metrics for carbon emissions reductions are to keep the global average temperature within the range needed to survive comfortably on this planet, and that we're not acting fast enough. As of just a few weeks ago, we have now had 12 consecutive months of global surface temperatures above that 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. We are already setting off tipping points that will be ever more catastrophic. We have to do better, meaning we all have to do our part, including within our own areas of expertise. This is the critical task for all humanity, and it is linked to so many of our current and future political and humanitarian crises. There are many different ways to break down the sources of carbon emissions across sectors and time. This complicated Sankey diagram tracks total emissions in their various forms, from the initial forms as resources on the left, including fossil fuels, minerals, ores, biomass, and waste, and moving from left to right, their extraction, processing, production, and use to meet societal needs, including mobility, housing, communication, healthcare, services, consumables, and nutrition. Each vertical swath represents our full carbon emissions just in their various forms over time. The dashed, re the dashed rectangle represents buildings, a large percentage of the total after raw resources have been processed, ready to serve societal needs. No matter how you look at it though, fully achieving zero net carbon is going to take effort across all sectors. So let's focus on ours, the built environment. In March, France and the United Nations co-organized the first Buildings and Climate Global Forum. The outcome of this meeting was the Declaration of Chalot, which was signed by representatives of 70 countries. This document lays the foundation for international cooperation in decarbonization of our built environment. It is a start to much needed progress in this arena and much more is sure to follow. Our existing buildings and infrastructure are a vast resource, a bank of carbon that has already been invested we can't continue throwing it out and starting over. This is crucially important, and we need to be very vocal about this in our out outreach and advocacy. Our carbon policies must incentivize retaining our existing buildings. Buildings are responsible for approximately 40% of global carbon emissions, including both operational and embodied or upfront carbon. In building intensive places like New York City or London, the local breakdown is closer to 70%. In any case, we can make a real difference here through the work we do. In historic conservation practice, which is my ex expertise, we address embodied carbon as a matter of course by extending the useful lives of our buildings through durability, maintenance, and repair. Our material selections affect the upfront carbon emissions. And as we support the redevelopment of the deconstruction, salvage, and reuse economy that was largely lost in the 20th century, we can help keep our materials and carbon investments in play. For operational carbon, we typically focus on the building envelope and systems to keep ourselves comfortable, including thermal comfort, lighting, and our daily activities. And so we look to the careful energy retrofit of our buildings with sound building science principles, with strategies like Passive House, and targets like zero net carbon design. But is this everything? Keep your building and retrofit it. The simplicity of the concept is vital for getting this message out to a wide audience, including to our policymakers. But in that simplicity is the danger of a false narrative that every bit of design and construction is equally well thought out and of equal performance and merit in need of the same retrofit for operational carbon performance. What does that even mean? What is improvement? And for that matter, what needs improvement? We need to consider how the design of our built environment fosters comfortable, long lasting occupancy, thoughtfully and sensibly meeting our needs and ideally delighting our senses now and into the future. And so today I would like to talk to you about the embodied wisdom of our global built heritage or what we've been calling inherently sustainable features. These are the design elements that improve comfort and habitability through their placement, layout, configuration, or use. Their basis in rationality and practicality 
have led to their repetition, translation into beauty and style, and have often become character-defining features, whether defining regional styles or transcending them. In our lifetimes, in the era of cheap fuel, it is easy to forget or not even realize how they came into being in the first place. We're surrounded by examples of features that serve a purpose and affect similes that do not. And it can take a surprising amount of effort to shift your focus to view features from this perspective. Shutters, for example, are used all over the world in all sorts of configurations and styles. Some protect from the cold, some block out the heating sun, some are for protection, durability, or privacy. And they come in all shapes, sizes, and styles. And yet, despite this variation, we see fake, inappropriate, and nonsensical shutters so often it's become a running joke. Similarly, when a parapet is merely shaped to ev evoke some idea of industrial chic, it entirely misses the point of what a sawtooth roof is, how it works, and why it was found so frequently on factory buildings in the first place. When features become shadows of themselves, playing lip service only, there is something very real lost. So let's really think about the purpose of these features, why they became character defining in the first place. Let's think about their authenticity of use and whether they are a strategic use of resources, which for our purposes translates to the carbon strategy. What is purely stylistic or decorative and what had an underlying purpose? Is that purpose still relevant? Can we continue to honor its purpose and harness that purpose to address our needs today while fostering a continuation of its underlying wisdom? The idea of embodied wisdom is an important paradigm shift in our thinking about our built heritage. And yet it builds upon what we as heritage professionals do best, searching the past for clues and finding ways to carry valuable pieces of our cultural heritage forward. For millennia, people have sought thermal comfort in their living environments through the effective and ingenious uses of available materials and energy. How many of these ideas can be effective in our strategies today? By employing this lens, we are putting our expertise into action as climate leadership through heritage conservation. This is what we can do. This is our superpower, our expertise put into action. For the sake of discussion, here's a boat-based analogy to illustrate these concepts. These two images are of a paddle wheel steamboat and a clipper ship, both 19th century types of boats, both suited to their purposes on their respective bodies of water. The paddle wheel and the elegant sails both were in place not to look pretty, but to move the vessel along. This river boat in Savannah, Georgia, currently offers rides along the river and is a popular tourist attraction. What caught my attention as it left the dock was the paddle wheel. It was entirely motionless and ineffective, tacked on purely for the image of it, for the idea, playing visual lip service to a boat of a bygone era. In contrast, this schooner has been lovely, lovingly restored and is in use by the South Street Seaport Museum in Manhattan. It serves many purposes, including as a teaching tool of both the materials and the actions associated with sailing such a vessel. But these traditional types of sailboats are now also being investigated and used again for their original purpose. The schooner Apollonia, for example, now sails the Hudson River, challenging the use of fossil fuel-based freight travel when it may not in fact be necessary in all cases. In doing so, it is rekindling a more holistic understanding of past technologies in context as a relevant carbon-free strategy for today. Of perhaps even more interest to me though, are the developments in the larger modern day shipping industry where sales are now being used to take advantage of the natural conditions and available renewable resources to improve the fuel efficiency in some cases by 20 to 35%. This application is not quaint and it is not hearkening back to a bygone era. It is instead recognizing, understanding and applying ancient wisdom in a new context. This application is relevant, synergistic, and exciting as it recognizes that systems can work together to make improvements. What I want to emphasize here is the differences, the difference in approaches to the past technologies. One ignores it and uses its imagery only. It's a caricature of the character defining features. The second restores and recreates in kind to understand and retain the technology and its context. And the third applies ancient wisdom to current needs in a new design context. The last two both represent an understanding of embodied wisdom and the authenticity of use in its application. 
Today, I'm going to present a sampling of embodied wisdom related to the thermal comfort in different climates, as well as lighting, durability, repair and maintenance, and resilience. We live in a world of many different climates. For our purposes, we can think about four very general climate types. These four have to do with our thermal comfort, whether we are too hot or too cold, and how the relative humidity affects that comfort, and how that changes seasonally. In cold climates, you want to gain and retain heat, whether from the sun or an internal source. In hot climates, you want to avoid and expel heat. In temperate or mixed climates, your strategy will depend on the season. Heat gain can take many forms. Heat radiates or travels through the air from heat sources like the sun. More effectively, heat is conducted by direct touch. Hands are warmed faster by holding on to a hot mug of coffee than just by hovering your hands near it. Heat rises, and as it cools, it falls back down again, creating convective heat loops. Orientation to both the height and the angle of the sun as it crosses the sky, and how that changes cyclically throughout the year, can be used to maximize the solar heat gain. Thermal mass, when strategically placed, can absorb heat from any source and radiate it back outward over a longer period of time. In a cold climate, you also want to hold on to your heat and not, as your parents always warned, try to instead heat the whole outdoors. Cold winter wind draws heat away. Limiting the exposure to prevailing winds will help minimize its effect. Compact volumes minimize the surface area where heat can be lost. An airtight building envelope will prevent warm air from being drawn out directly. And insulation slows the heat transfer through the materials of the enclosure. Smaller volumes require less heat input to keep warm, and limiting airflow between spaces allows you to make use of the gained heat in one space for longer. Our patterns of living, sleeping, cooking, and other activities greatly influence our experiences of thermal comfort. These strategies are often employed together, and they take form in a number of beautiful, thoughtful ways. On cold days, enclosed farmyards and plazas both invite in the warm sunshine and keep out the chill of the wind to make these spaces comfortable for longer than they would be otherwise. Swiss buildings are traditionally compact volumes with stuccoed airtight exteriors. On Cape Cod, along the New England coast, the lower back of this house faces and redirects the cold north winds. The utilitarian spaces serve as a thermal buffer, while the habitable spaces enjoy the cozy warm sunlight from the south facing windows. These very thick thatched roofs in Japan and the sod roofs common in the Faroe Islands both provide insulation. The window to wall ratio is important as glass is not as insulative as a solid wall and windows provide opportunities for air infiltration. Exterior storm windows reduce air infiltration and add insulation while still allowing daylight, solar heat gain and visibility. Solid shutters are operable and more durable than glass and are more likely to be used at night, during a storm, or when the space is not in use. This casement window in Old Quebec has a seasonally installed exterior storm window. One pane is operable to still allow airflow when desired. The primary window itself has an edge detail where the two sashes meet that functions as a weather seal. In Central Europe, box, fence, box windows are a form of insulated window openings with pairs of operable sashes. Collectively, the pairs of windows create an airspace much wider than that found in our insulated glazing, with components that can be operated, repaired, and maintained. Entry vestibules minimize heat loss at doorways. Offset doors minimize wind blowing all the way through. Thermal masses, like centrally located massive chimneys and tile ovens, retain the heat from the fires within to radiate out into the rooms for a longer period of time. Conductive underfloor heating is used around the world. In ancient, the ancient Romans used hippocausts. In Northern China, a raised heated platform called a kang is used both for sleeping and for daytime activity. The Korean undol system uses the heat from the kitchen to warm the stone floor slab in the rest of the house before it is exhausted from a chimney at the other side. Traditional black forest farmhouses are compact forms with small windows and are built above their barns. The rising heat off of their livestock warms the human residents living upstairs. Some strategies thoughtfully limit what is needed, what needs to be warmed. Ingle nooks provide cozy seating in a semi-enclosed space near the fire. 
Bed curtains create small enclosed spaces to keep in the warmth as you sleep. In Japan, a kotatsu consists of a heater placed under a table enclosed by a heavy, heavy blanket tablecloth. In Afghanistan and Iran, the same concept is called a corsi. In European palaces, tapestries insulated the walls in addition to being gorgeous works of art. Heavy curtains keep out the cold when drawn. In hot climates, you want to avoid any heat gain and you want to get rid of any heat that does come in. Solar orientation is important for hot climates to minimize the solar heat gain. Shading blocks the hot sun. Light colors and other reflective surfaces help to bounce that incoming heat away. In some cases, insulation can also be use, useful to block heat from getting in. To get rid of heat, prevailing winds can be harnessed to draw heat away. Breezes can also be induced, such as through geometries that make use of the Venturi effect, which speeds airflow through constricted spaces. Heat rises, and geometries that create a stack effect, or chimney effect, draw hot air up and out of the building. Tall spaces also allow heat to rise up and away from people. The amount of humidity in the air greatly influences many of the other options for getting rid of unwanted heat. In hot, arid climates, evaporative cooling works well, and it is easier to remain comfortable at higher temperatures. Dry air does not hold on to heat very well, and temperatures fluctuate rapidly. Hot air may be flushed out of your building into the cooler nighttime air before it heats up again the next day. Thermal mass can be used as a well-timed heat sink and a heat source to create a time lag compatible with the daily temperature swings, whether the heat is released or it makes its way through to the inside in time to counteract the chill. In hot, humid climates, all the moisture in the air retains the heat and temperatures do not drop as drastically at night. Strategies harnessing daily temperature swings are not very effective and it can be preferable to avoid thermal mass and instead opt for materials that do not retain heat. Evaporative cooling is less effective in moisture saturated air and needs more air movement than in drier settings. Ventilation and breezes are encouraged through open floor plans, cross ventilation and more surface area on a non-compact sprawling building exterior. Vegetation cools its surroundings, both through shading and through evapotranspiration. Studies in urban areas indicate that air temperatures can be up to five degrees Celsius cooler on tree-lined streets and in parks than on neighboring streets lacking vegetation. Additionally, trees and vegetation have been shown to improve air and water quality, storm water management, and overall quality of life. In Capri, some paths are shaded by trees or grapevines, but they are also more consistently lined by tall masonry walls, providing shade from one side or the other. In Iran, sabots cover portions of streets, inducing breezes and providing pedestrians respite from the hot sun. Light colors reflect the hot sunlight away. These narrow whitewashed streets in Greece and Portugal also take advantage of the shading of one building on another, induced breezes and thermal mass. The Charleston, South Carolina single house typology is oriented to harness the prevailing breezes and the long porch along the south face provides shade. The more modest shotgun house typology is also set up for front to back ventilation. Tall ceilings and windows allow heat to rise up and away from buildings in these rooms. Porches provide outdoor living space, shade and shelter from rain while still encouraging ventilation through open windows. Porches take many forms, including this wraparound veranda in Antigua and this deep lanai in Hawaii. Retractable awnings and fixed overhangs should ideally work with the local angle of the sun to shade as much as is needed. Retractable awnings at the, piazza, at the piazza of a mosque in Saudi Arabia provide shade for pilgrims to the site. And Snohada just completed a redesign of the campus of the Blanton Museum of Art, including sculptural elements that collect rainwater and shade the courtyard with a dappled filtered light. Horizontal shading can be porous to allow airflow and can be designed as a support for vegetation, including grapevines. Extended eaves and wraparound balconies are also shading devices. Louvered shutters block the sun while still allowing for ventilation and views. And to exterior blinds and Bahama shutters tilt outward at the bottom to maximize shading and ventilation. Fixed screen sight walls and adjustable louvered walls also provide shade while maintaining ventilations and views. 
This wood screen panel in, in China and this jolly in India are beautifully decorative elements that do the same. Mashrabias in the Middle East project beyond the building facade to maximize their simultaneous shading and ventilation. Jars of water are placed within to also provide evaporative cooling. They're also found in Spain, and their presence as a built form has made their way via Spain to Peru and to the California coast. The wind catchers, or bad gears in the Middle East, are very distinctive climate-driven features. Hot air is drawn up one side of the thermal chimney, drawing cooling wind back down the other. The proportions are driven by local conditions. In more humid areas near the sea, the bad gears are lower and wider. Where the air is drier, the bad gears are taller and more slender to capture the faster wind and avoid windblown dust. The air is further cooled by the evaporative cooling of an underground canal or canat. This combination can cool the air by up to 12 degrees Celsius. In Turkey, adobe domed beehive houses create a thermal chimney with the rising heat venting from the top. The domes maximize surface area for evaporative cooling while providing shade for half of the roof where there otherwise would be none. Yakchals push the swarm to the extreme to store ice and food in the desert. On a much smaller scale, botijos and zirpots use evaporative cooling to keep water and food cool. A company in India is now working with the same concept to sell terracotta refrigerators that require no electricity. Bioli or step, wall, step wells in India step down to the water table and provide access to water, as well as providing a cool respite from the heat. Fountains cool the surrounding air while providing a soothing cooling sound. And courtyard houses provide shaded sheltered spaces with air circulation for the interior spaces. Here is a haveli in India and the courtyard of a Chinese home. Similar concepts can be found in Iran and in Pompeii. Some courtyards enhance their thermal comfort and delight with fountains. Sheltered exterior spaces can be used to minimize the need for interior conditioned space, such as in a condo build in, in condo building hallways in Florida and in airport gates in Hawaii. These two houses in Indonesia and in Florida are built of lightweight materials raised up on stilts, allowing cooler shaded air to pass below the floor. The stilts on the Florida house provided a measure of resilience against storm surges for decades until the surge was too high in Hurricane Ian in 2022. Ceiling fans circulate air and help draw hot air upward. They can also be reversed to push warm air downward in cooler seasons. Punkas move air by swinging back and forth. Wicker furniture allows for cooling airflow and picnic tables under the shade of pergolas or trees extend living patterns outdoors. Heat generating activities can be relegated to separate outbuildings. This Miami homeowner keeps their washer and dryer in an outdoor shed, reducing their cooling load even without the use of a clothesline. This outbuilding kitchen in China keeps the heat and fire risk away from the main house. Sleeping patterns can look different in hot climates. Hammocks take advantage of nighttime breezes. Ceramic headdress, such as this one from China, dissipate rather than collect warmth. Sleeping porches seek airflow and any cooler nighttime breezes. In temperate or mixed climates, strategies from both hot and cold climates are used in tandem or depending on which is the more dominant season. The variability of conditions throughout the year becomes important to work with and to address. Deciduous trees and vegetation lose their leaves in the winter, allowing for additional solar heat gain when it is needed the most. In greenhouses, conservatories, and other places with sky-facing glazing, a seasonal whitewash shading can be applied to maximize solar heat gain in the winter and minimize it in the summer. Operability and adjustability become important to accommodate shifting conditions. Operable windows are a prime example. Double-hung windows can be operated in tandem to induce stronger breezes, with small openings on the lower sash on the windward side and larger openings on the upper sash on the leeward side. Retractable awnings, umbrellas, and seasonal use of blankets, rugs, and seasonally appropriate, appropriate clothing all serve to dynamically adjust the thermal comfort. In many locations, there are long-standing traditions of escaping the summer heat through visits to summer homes or to community garden plots. Arcades provide protection from the sun and precipitation in any climate. 
Like other fixed shading devices, ideally their height and depth are aligned to allow in the low angle of the winter sun. So far we've focused on thermal comfort and to a lesser extent activity by way of living patterns. But there are other types of embodied wisdom to consider as well. Like thermal comfort, lighting is largely a matter of operational carbon. Bay windows capture more daylight to bring into the space. Splayed windows, particularly in thick walls, spread the available daylight and soften the visual contrast between the window and the wall. Clara story windows bring daylight deep into a space that would otherwise be too far away from the exterior walls. Lanterns and sawtooth roofs also bring daylight deep into a space. Like Clara story windows, they are often found on industrial buildings with deep footprints. So to address that example at the beginning, sawtooth roofs are much more than just the shape of a parapet. Skylights and, and covered arcades also bring in considerable daylight, although depending on the location and the season, they may be prone to much more heat loss or solar heat gain. Taken to an extreme, the 1972 Olympic Stadium in Munich was built at a time when television technology would not have been able to accommodate the stark shadows of an opaque stadium roof. Artists, designers, and others requiring bright, consistent lighting for detailed work have long preferred spaces with tall, ideally north-facing windows. Some such buildings are purpose-built for this need, such as RPI's School of Architecture, which has much larger windows than its contemporary buildings on campus. Others are highly sought after as a repurposing of existing spaces, such as factory buildings or the industrial cast iron loft buildings of Soho in New York. Through the use of glazed interior walls, doors and windows, daylight can be borrowed from one space to the next. Transom windows can also be used for it, can they, they can also be operable for airflow. Sidewalk vault lights and glass block walls provide ample daylight in a more robust built form, but limited if any visibility. Light transmission can also take a dramatic joyful approach, such as through stained glass or dal de verre. Glass is not the only material to allow transmission of daylight. Some Greek temples were noted to have had marble roof tiles thin enough to be transparent, translucent and create a glowing effect inside. The Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library on Yale's campus achieved this effect with its thin marble cladding. It is important to note that daylighting is distinct from solar heat gain, although many of the same strategies can apply. While related by their very nature, the needs for light and heat may vary and are at times at odds with each other. Our personal protection from the sun can take multiple forms in a layered approach. Similarly, there are many ways we can control daylighting to invite in the light, prevent overheating, and reduce the glare. So it's not just through the treatment of the glass itself and its transparency, but also through its orientation, size, placement, and through other building and site elements. Operable features such as louvers, blinds, and curtains can also be employed. The use of mirrors, including on walls or doors, can reflect light further into a space and improve the perceived brightness. Adjusting the angle of louvers can reflect the desired light levels upward into the space while, while maintaining privacy. This is particularly useful with upturned curved louvers like Venetian blinds. Durability, repair, and ease of maintenance are also part of the design carbon strategy. There is embodied wisdom to be observed there too. Durability and repair can be thought of as two approaches to the same overall intent of extending the functional lifespan of a building. The durability of different materials varies, of course, but their overall longevity is also determined by their use, placement, configuration, and exposure. For example, whether it is sheltered or exposed, whether it is subject to structural loads, thermal stresses, water, material incompatibilities, and physical wear. There's a lot to consider in this category, but I'll be brief. In cold, snowy climates, steep pitches help, help extend a roof's lifespan by preventing snow buildup to the extent that it can cause structural damage. Deep eaves divert rainwater away from the building facade. On this house in British Columbia, the eaves are, are such an aesthetic feature that the fascias exaggerate the overhead. Like drip edges, these decorative drip tiles in China focus the runoff from the roof to prevent water damage to the wood and stuccoed walls below. 
The timber framing and wood panels in the courtyard of this house in China rest on a stone course and a decoratively carved stone block protecting them from the moisture and rising damp they would otherwise be exposed to if they rested directly on grade. Likewise, this timber post in a barn in Ontario follows the same strategy, even though it's far less ornate. The unpainted post is otherwise protected from the elements by being in an interior, if unconditioned, location. These sloped wood rafter tails on a porch roof in Georgia are slightly set back from the edge of the roof and are protected from the wind-driven rain by the gutter. Furthermore, the carved shape and the painted finish produce a series of drip edges and a material layer of protection. As the climate changes and storms become more intense, the size of the gutter may need to be reevaluated if this has not happened already. As you walk around New York, you will notice that most of the limestone facades rest on a granite base. The granite is much more resistant to water staining and damage than the limestone. It is placed here strategically where it is needed allowing the rest of the facade to perform well in limestone or even brick or other more susceptible but more affordable materials. Durable details can be made with not so durable materials. This stucco sheltered under an overhang is over 2000 years old. Compare that to this thin veneer panel of stone that was less than 30 years old when this photo was taken. Its location near grade along a busy sidewalk and its detailing meant that it was susceptible to being broken and not readily repaired. The material is durable and expensive, but its use led to its premature failure. This wood framed and painted wood clabbered house, clabbered clad house sit, sits atop a masonry ba basement wall, protecting it from direct exposure to the moisture in the soil. Each clabbered functions as a drip edge to direct water away from that building. The masonry has a sacrificial coating of tinted stucco, providing both a uniform appearance and a protective layer for an irregular substrate. In this interior hallway, the marble flooring gets the most wear. The painted wood chair rail and paneled wainscot absorb more damage than the painted plaster walls above. In either of these examples, if the placement of these materials were shuffled, the overall condition of the finishes would suffer in comparison and would require more repairs and replacement. Repairs and maintenance are also things we're all familiar with in this field. They include, among other things, the ability to repair or replace areas of damage only, of damage only, rather than whole units. Stone Dutchman repairs and wood window sash repairs are two such examples. But they also include the thoughtfulness of initial design to allow this to happen. At times, it may include sacrificial elements and small-scale replacement to prevent the need for repair or replacement of larger elements. These small, vertically-oriented wood log segments that touch grade are understood to be in an area of faster damage and can be replaced individually as needed. Likewise, the wood shingle cladding on this wall can be replaced in kind individually as needed rather than all at once. Which brings us to the last topic. As we face the evolving conditions of our changing climate, I would like to also introduce the thought that durability and repair in a more extreme form are a part of a broader resilience strategy. Likewise, we will need to understand the thermal comfort strategies of the coming climate of a place, not just those of the past climate. Many, but not all of the threats to our built environment center around changes to the water, temperature and wind intensity. Others are a result of the consequences of these changes. Buildings also need to function, even in extreme conditions, when unoccupied, when damaged, or when there is a loss of power for many days, such as after an intense storm. Operable windows and natural ventilation can be used even in the absence of a power source. They allow for breathing, temperature control and thermal comfort, and drying out to prevent mildew and water damage. In short, continued habitability. Compare this to the sealed windows that were damaged or deliberately shattered after Hurricane Katrina. Entire buildings were made uninhabitable because they were dependent on a, on a constant power source. Resilience includes not only the longevity of our built environments, but also, and more importantly, our ability to inhabit them and the settings in which they are built. Traditional whitewashed limestone Bermuda roofs are designed to catch rainfall to store for future use. The whitewash reflects the sunlight to keep cool, and its antimicrobial properties help keep the water clean. The heavy limestone is very durable 
and can withstand hurricane winds. Rainwater collection is stored in rain barrels or in underground cisterns. On the windy, arid Italian island of Pantelleria, another inhabited island with no ground source of fresh water, the distinctive domed roofs of the traditional Demusi homes are also used to collect rainwater and channel it into underground cisterns for use. As in other examples we've seen previously, the mass volcanic rock stone walls of these single story homes also serve as excellent thermal mass to keep the interiors comfortable. Also on Pantelleria, ancient circular dry laid stone walls create microclimates that nurture single citrus trees that would be unable to grow there otherwise. The walls block the wind, allow in as much sunlight as possible, and act as, as thermal masses to moderate the temperature daily, the daily temperature swings. They capture and retain dew, fog, and rain in the porous volcanic rocks, as well as rainwater channeled there from rare rainstorms, allowing self-sufficient growth without irrigation or other human intervention. Similar ideas of thermal mass were used further north in Europe with the idea of fruit walls. In a Parisian suburb, Hundreds of miles of peach walls running predominantly north-south created enclosed orchards that optimize sunlight, thermal mass, and protection from wind to maintain temperatures typically 8 to 12 degrees Celsius warmer than their surroundings to successfully grow up to 17 million quality fruits each year at their height in the 1870s. Further north, some of the south-facing fruit walls, like this one in Wales, were heated with horizontal flues or hot, pipe, hot water pipes to protect against frost. By the 19th century, some Belgian and Dutch cultivators began experimenting with, place, with placing glass plates against the fruit walls, creating the first greenhouses. By the 20th century, the thermal mass of fruit walls was replaced by the use of fossil fuels. If we were to achieve our carbon goals, it seems that some of these older and forgotten methods could be revived where they make sense. Finally, resilience also includes the awareness and incorporation of nature-based solutions. In Devon, it was recently reported that the beavers that, that were reintroduced to the region after centuries of local extinction had, within 10 years, created new wetlands and a landscape more resilient to flooding and droughts. In warmer climates, mangroves are extremely effective at, absor at absorbing the energy of storm surges it would be wise to consider reintroducing them where we had deliberately removed them in the past. If we are to improve the resilience of our living environments, we need to continue and to improve the use of our urban environments to reduce the pressure of sprawl and facilitate the power of the natural world around us. The inspiration I'm sharing with you today by definition is not new. While it represents many years of identifying and collecting examples, the concepts are well outlined in a number of excellent resources. These are a few of my favorites, which I can share with you afterwards. This overview is a small sample of the global diversity of human wisdom on this topic. There is much more to be learned from other traditions, and that is the intention for the ongoing development of this project. Strategies often have cultural significance. I've only discussed the physical, climate-driven aspects, but it is important to acknowledge that they don't happen in a vacuum. With a heightened awareness of traditional strategies, we can be better equipped to apply this wisdom appropriately to inspired new design as well, whether or not it is in a historic context. There are many more examples out there and more to be discovered when you shift your mode of thinking about the world around us. And so I pose a question to you. What features and detailing do you find that can optimize the needs of thermal comfort, durability, and resilience? What features and detailing do you find that can reduce embodied and operational carbon use in fulfilling these needs? And what do you see when you truly look and listen to the quiet wisdom of climate-based design? As I wrap up, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. There is no perfect solution in any climate, whether new or traditional. Consider these features to be a part of a well-considered layered overall carbon strategy. They provide a richer palette to work with. We can investigate, celebrate, and enhance the features and details that allow our buildings to perform well, even before any further modern day interventions are considered. We can better advocate for their retention, restoration, or reconstruction of character defining features when the climate impact is understood as more than nice to have features 
for a later phase, if at all. We can consider appropriate use of resources and pursue strategies that are compatible with our building features to improve performance through modification rather than full replacement. Our buildings must remain habitable in extreme conditions, say if the power is out for several days after a storm. These strategies beyond normal conditions may also become part of the resilience plan. As our local climates continue to change, it is important to better understand the strategies and features that work well in the new climate and find ways to work them sensitively and appropriately into our buildings. The features and strategies of, our, of this presentation today are currently being gathered on the OSCAR website. I invite you to come back to the site in the near future to make use of this resource. Thank you. I thank you very much, Corey. So many inspiring examples, fantastic. Thank we you. are now starting the session of questions and answers. If you have any questions, please unmute your microphone and ask directly your questions. You can also switch to video so we can see you. We have, oh, that's a comment from Martina. Martina, do you have any questions? Oh, no, mm -hmm. time from Martina. I will start with a question of myself then. Can you please detail a bit the content of the Shio Declaration from March 2024 this year and how its implementation would be affecting the preservation of the heritage significance of the historic and protected buildings. How can you give us a bit a differentiation of applying it, something like that? Okay, so I think you caught me a little bit. I'm not, I will, I will let you know. I, I was very aware that it happened. A number of my colleagues were a part of the delegations going there to be part of this to make sure that there is um that that there really is heritage representation here really talking about climate and heritage and how they interact together um this happened in march i have to say i'm not as well versed especially at the moment as i might be i do know that it is a um it's a declaration meaning it's really i mean it's it, it was very significant in the fact that that this is really one of the first times that um heritage traditional heritage of any sort, tangible and intangible inher heritage, is really being represented in some of these uh, UN declarations as we're dealing with um, uh, climate change. You know, I mean, even if you go back to the sustainable development goals from a number of years ago, they're kind of hidden, they're tucked into, to, into uh, goal 11, I think 11 point, I don't remember which one, but they're kind of tucked in, they're not really, I mean, for, for they're, they're, not, they're, they're not very overtly discussed. And for a part of our carbon strategy, if, if we are responsive, if our built environment is responsible for 40% of the emissions, we really need to be talking about this. This is a huge elephant in the room. And when you look at over time, when half of that is, is really addressing existing buildings and keeping them going, all of the upfront embodied carbon there, that's a huge piece of it. And so the fact that this declaration even exists is huge and it's something that we all really should be celebrating. That said, I know that it's kind of an initial piece. It's, it's talking about the intentions of how this, this goes about. I don't know enough about all the inner workings of it. And I think my understanding is that, that all the, the fine tuning inner workings of how that's actually going to come about is going to be something that is going to be developed as we go forward. This is more stating what the goal is and, and what we need to do. How we do it is another question. Yes, I only hope that really important historical buildings will have a slightly different treatment and it will be aimed to have a balance in between heritage value and improvement of the carbon. Of course, and I think that's why it's so important that there have been so many people in this very field being a part of the conversation. Um, you know, that Parts of it are making sure that we're dealing with our buildings appropriate, but part of it is also making sure that we are hanging onto that embodied wisdom, right? And both of those pieces going together, how do we how do we utilize that embodied wisdom? How do we not lose that embodied wisdom? And how do we work with what our current environment is uh, for our current needs uh, to make sure that these buildings are 
working well here, and also so that they're resilient to the effects of climate change. So it's really a, a number of different pieces going together. And I think the heritage fields all have so much to offer. And I think it's very important that we are all uh, collectively um, a part of this conversation to help guide how everything gets developed. You know, every piece of it, you know, I started off, I mean, this is, this is an existential threat. We really need to continue living on this planet at least I'd like to, you know, I mean, we can't, we don't really have much of a choice there. But the choice is really about how, you know, we have this goal, how do we make that happen? And we all have roles to play. We all need to find ways to make that happen in a way that makes sense and make sure that we're all part of that conversation. So, yeah. Martina Bacifici has a question. Would you like Martina to unmute your microphone and ask your question directly, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was amazing. I really like uh, uh, the, I mean, everything in the narrative. And um, uh, my question is, uh, how do you tackle the issue that uh, our standards of comfort are much higher nowadays uh, compared to the times when actually these uh, sustainable technologies and features were created originally? So basically, these technologies are not enough, unfortunately, but perhaps uh, Combine it together, uh, we can still make use of them without using uh, more carbon intensive uh, active uh, uh, strategies and uh, uh, services. Hi, Martino. Thank you. And that's an that's an excellent question. And I think that's something that is really um, that's really what like the big challenge that we all need to be working towards. And, you know, part of it, as you know, anytime you're dealing with existing buildings, sometimes the answer is, Broadly is it depends. And then the more specific answers really are specific to the exact condition. But part of it, you know, you're talking about our, our standards have, have changed, right? And a lot of that is really true. And I think there's a certain part of that that we need to revisit, right? Um, you know, like our, I will say that that I live in a part of the world where, where people tend to say, oh, it's hot out, let's crank up the air conditioning till the point where it's like sitting inside a refrigerator. It drives me crazy that I, that, that it's so frequent that I feel like I need to put on a sweater when it's not uh, 30 degrees out, 30 degrees Celsius out. Um, or it's so warm and cozy when it's zero out that I feel like I need to be wearing a t-shirt. We need to really be thinking about some of that kind of stuff. And I think part of that is, you know, we all grew up in this era of cheap fuel where it doesn't matter. Seal up the box, crank out the crank up the AC or crank up the heat and, and you're fine, whatever. We should really think about that. Do we, is that really, does that really make sense? There's also physiological things where they talk about, you know, if you go through too much of a, it's like, it's much healthier to not have too much of a drastic temperature switch between going from indoors and outdoors. And that's something that we haven't really been talking about. And I think we need to, and that's not just architects. I think that's society in general and what our expectations are. Um, and that's not to say no air conditioning ever. I mean, we're, we're at a point where that's actually a, a health concern. Um, we are we are experiencing such hot temperatures. I mean, I also just started off the presentation with like, oh my God, it's so hot and humid out there. I'm so glad to have the AC as much as I really don't like air conditioning. I love to have the window, window open and have fresh breezes coming through. But the reality is our climates are changing. Um, so some of that is is what our expectations are. And there, and there, and there is a certain amount of... Um, uh, acclimatization, right? If you're if you're in a place where it's warm all the time, you become more accustomed to warmer uh, mm -hmm. temperatures, and vice versa. You know, like I think about how how the same temperature in the you know if it's uh, ten to fifteen degrees Celsius in the spring, it's like woohoo! It's so warm out. Let's break out the t shirt and the shorts and everything. Mm -hmm. In in the fall, it gets down to that temperature. You're like, oh my god, it's freezing. It's because you're coming from one temperature to the other of what that feels like. And, and some of that, I, I think we need to be cognizant of all of that, but, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this as a, like, well, that that's it, end of story, you know, that, that that's a piece of it, but we also need to understand enough about the building science. We need to understand how our buildings are working. We need to understand first where our energy sources are, not first, I'm not sure which sequence here, on, on one, one element, we need to understand where our energy sources are coming from. So, you know, we, we like right now there's a push towards electrification because you can electrify the grid rather than having all these individual 
places where you have all these fires emitting carbon and you know whether it's boilers or what have you um that is much more energy efficient but then also let's think about the way our buildings function do we need to be pumping it like it can what part can we do like Let's let's talk about you know all of the features that I just talked about, right? And some of those are things that existed on our buildings already. And so, like you know, if if that was taken, if some of those features were removed or blocked up or something at one point, they're no longer effective. Hey, you know what? They were there. Why don't we talk about putting that back again? And and that will help. Um, and sometimes it's like, well, some of these concepts from other places or other buildings, we can take those concepts and find ways to sensitively fit them into the buildings. I mean, we've been, you know, for for like the last hundred years, we've been finding ways to put in, to, to, to cram in air conditioning ducts into heritage buildings. That's not original mm -hmm. either. And so maybe if we're gonna think about alterations and modifications, let's think about the ones that make sense in a different way. But, you know, it, but you know, like anything, anytime you're doing any kind of adaptation to a building and to your expectations, um, you kind of need to weigh what it all, what it, all comes down to. Um, I do think, you know, and, and what your expectations are for any given building. Um, you know, in, 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 you know, where I am in, in the US dealing with um, heritage uh, conservation, you know, there was a, a number of years ago, it, my, my understanding is that for, for quite a bit of the 20th century, as we were able to do so, and it was actually things that were learned from, uh, uh, Conser I think art conservation in World War II, that it's like, hey, if we keep keep things in a very stable temperature, very stable relative humidity and don't change it, then that's what we need. That's the best thing ever. And you see the way museums, like what, what their interior climate requirements are. Sure, that's great. But the reality is a person doesn't need to be at 50% relative humidity and exactly this temperature all the time. There, we have a little more give. And depending on what we're doing, if we're talking about a place where we want to be comfortable, let's talk about what that actually means. Let's talk about and and the, you know, there's it's not just these numbers. There's also that idea of thermal delight. Um, one of my favorite books that I think I had on the list was talking about thermal delight. You know, it's like sitting by a by a fireplace is very different than sitting in a very stable environment, or like getting sitting somewhere where the the sun's coming in, like that picture of that cat, like that is cozy. You want to think about what all the the coziness or the thermal delight pieces of it are, um, or somewhere where you do have a breeze coming through, and that's wonderful. Um, but I think we need to to think carefully about what our ranges and what our tolerances are. How do we achieve what's comfortable? And 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 you know be more thoughtful about that um i don't know i think i just went on a big tangent i'm not sure that i directly answered your question yeah, no absolutely <laughs> absolutely thank you so much again i think it, yeah you, um, i think your, your answer showed that there are so many layers to address um, and communication is key because ultimately is about people that need to be comfortable in a space so yeah as you say let's talk about it yeah <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and I think, you know, to, to, to tack onto that a little bit, I think part of this is the fact that we do have a lot of different tools at our disposal and we have a lot of different types of spaces with different needs. And so it's not really a one size fits all, not for uses and not for buildings. And so we do need to be very careful and nuanced in the way we do things. Very interesting answer. And before giving uh, space to Benson to ask himself the question, I would like to ask another question to Martina's question. If having a comfortable space, very comfortable space, worth the price of losing identity? Because if we modify those buildings just to get comfort beyond the recognition, mm -hmm. outside or inside, we will lose something maybe more precious that we would somehow compensate with a bit of... Um, resilience us as the humans and the danger of losing un how to say irreversible losing heritage it's something mm -hmm. that some of us are not ready to accept so oh. benson please unmute your microphone and ask your question directly hi thank you so much for the wonderful presentation uh my name is Benson. I'm currently a student uh, at the University of Notre Dame doing a master's in historic preservation. 
uh, as a student architect uh, during my undergraduate, uh, the issues that you just addressed were very emphasized. So my, and out there in practice while dealing with clients, working on projects, you find that it's hard to sell them on these concepts that have been proven to work time and time again. They tend to focus on the new technology, the new construction materials, uh, it's very commercial, focuses on construction speed, construction cost, and profit margins, as opposed to material quality and psychosocial health that comes with natural lighting, ventilation. So how, how do you think I can illustrate the value of the concepts that you shared to clients of new, new architecture? Thank you. Excellent question. Um... And and also that the fact that where you're going to school made me realize I switched everything over into into metric. I should have kept my Fahrenheit and my <laughs> everything in there so that we're talking on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, no, that's okay. You know that's a it's a it's a. You know I think this is part of a challenge the challenge of being an architect and part of the challenge of working in in historic preservation. Um, it, it, you know, which is an aspect of it, but architects in general, I mean, part of what we do is synthesize an awful lot of competing interest and competing things and trying to get the right, the value, you know, value in a very broad term, broad sense of the word, bring in all these values together. What is, what is comfortable? What is affordable? What is, what are the things you're looking for? Um, you know, it's it's sometimes and some of these things go together and and actually, um, sorry, just lost my what I was going to say there. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I I a lot of it is is discussing what all of this means. Um, and some of this, to a certain point, comes down to what what does comfort mean? What is um what is luxury? What is utility? What is and that's not you know, there are a number of ways of defining that. You know, one of the things, you know, the work that my office does is really dealing with existing buildings, heritage buildings across the spectrum from any old existing building to a superly, super historically significant building and everything in between. And what can we do to improve the, the energy performance and the carbon mitigation strategies and all of that. And a lot of that comes down to understanding how the building worked to begin with. And, and some of it is okay. Yeah, I mean, so, so first of all, there's no time period that's perfect. There never was, there never will be. And I'm not, I have no illusion that, that anything we're doing at any point in time is the one and only answer. It's really that we're looking at, at different systems and different paradigms. And so I think what we need to do is recognize the values and the and the things that that come out and the wisdom that comes from all of these different time periods. And so some of that is what is that what was this building originally? What were the materials that were used? What were you, you know and 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 then how do we keep those going as long as possible? How do you repair them? How do you keep them going? And also the thoughts behind what new materials are used, what assemblies are used and how long they're going to last. So, you know, one of the pieces that I am very hopeful for for all of us is the fact that, you know, for all of the, for as long as we've been talking about, you know, energy efficiency, and now we're, we're using the, the terminology of, of carbon, because at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. That's why we're concerned about it in terms of what we're pumping into the atmosphere and cooking ourselves. We want to make sure, you know, it's for so long, we've been talking about the operational carbon only, and that's half of it. We're missing, we've been missing the other half, which is how do we keep our buildings going? And how do we treat them? And how do we, what are we selecting? You know, some of the, some of the things that drive me crazy are the materials that are sold. And, you know, it's like, hey, you can take this material. Um, sorry, one example comes to mind. I remember at one point, someone trying to, to, to sell, you know, pitch to our office years ago, like here for the slate roof, if you have the slate that's attached to a membrane on the back of it and you could do this thing and it's somehow it made it cheaper. I don't quite understand, but really you're taking a material that by itself, good quality slate is gonna last well over a hundred years. You put that with copper flashing and that is also going to last well over a hundred years. You start putting in these weak links that take that, that mean that it's not detailed well, that it's going to break, that you're going to lose the durability of something that was already there to, to, to then have to replace it in 20 years. I'm sorry, but that's the stupidest thing. And it, and it, I got, I got upset about it when, when this came about, 
And, you know, one of the things that I do on, you know, in, in my projects is like, you know, we're always looking at what the detailing is. You can, you know, it for, for the amount of time that it takes to say, I'll come up with an example here, like to like by, by the time you replace a steel lintel and put waterproofing over it, if you're not putting the waterproofing on it and or you're not detailing it properly and it fails, you're going to have to rip that wall open again. You're going to have to do that all over again. And how many materials are lost, how much time, how much expense, all of these things, as opposed to and, and carbon, all of that, like if we do things thoughtfully and correctly, the first time it's going to last so much longer and we're going to get that time value of the carbon that goes in. And so the same thing with any type of design for the, the amount that you're putting in, you wanna think through part of it is, is what's the, the life cycle, not only the life cycle financial cost, but the life cycle carbon cost. And what does that mean? And I think one of the things that may be helping with all of this, as we are all collectively becoming aware of this and as we are starting to collectively quantify embodied carbon, upfront carbon metrics for things, I mean, which is much harder to do, um, but we're, you know, there's that, there's this process happening right now. As we start doing this and we're talking more about it, we can, you know, there are different places, you know, like where I know that some different countries in Europe are starting to do this. And I did have something on a, on a slide here about the state of California is doing this as well, that we're starting to actually acknowledge the fact that embodied carbon is, is an important part of the whole thing. And there are, you know, that there are metrics now for how to step down the use of embodied carbon and how do we do things where we're using more um, carbon sequestering materials, low carbon materials. How do we how do we do that? But we want to do it in the ways where we where they are durable and and part of that is the material and part of that is the detailing and it all goes hand in hand. Similarly, you don't want to use a high carbon and highly carbon intensive material for something that you're just going to get rid of or you're not going to be able to repair um you know and 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 that can be just as as ridiculous and you know when you think about the materials that are in common use right now like we're using a lot of aluminum we're using a lot of steel a lot of uh, uh plastics a lot of things that are carbon intense, I'm coming up with this <laughs> list off the top of my head, but like thinking through what we're using versus what traditional materials were. And we want to really think about what, what's being used where. And it's not to say never use the highly carbon intensive material, but do so thoughtfully that you're actually going to get the time value out of it. Otherwise, we're just shooting ourselves in the foot and we're not helping anything. I hope that helps. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Uh, we will take Raza now, which has has been waiting for a while. Thank you. Hi, Raza. Hi. How are you, Corey? Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I uh, just wanted to throw the quick comment in there that I'm a physician, and and definitely the um, having a static uh, temperature on your body is not only detrimental, but it all, it often leads to mental illness. We've, we've found, mm -hmm. um, the, the change in, in temperature color of the actual, um, the sky is an important, uh, cue to our brain to actually maintain important, uh, aspects of mental health. Um, I'm, I'm calling from, uh, Houston, Texas, where we just experienced a, uh, in category two or category three hurricane we right. about two million people lost power and we kind of are experiencing you know no no ac and uh the just kind of waking up to the realization that our energy intensive lives are pretty delicate do you have any have you seen you know i i uh, thank you for mentioning the windows and katrina uh, any other uh, recommendations for hot humid climates how we can how we can adapt um, to increasing floods and things like that in in these type of environments. Thank you. Thank you, Razel. First of all, I, I mean I'm amazed that you're calling in as as a doctor rather than an architect. I think it's fascinating. I would love to talk more and hear some of your perspectives on things. Um, and I agree. You know, I I feel like some of this keeping everything static. It's like the visual and thermal equivalent of of living in gray, in beige. <laughs> we can beige everything all the time. It's just like, no, I mean, that drives me crazy. I mean, it's part of why I've got the picture of the background that I do. That's much happier for me. Um, and and I'm 
you know, I wouldn't think worrying about all of you in, in Houston that were directly hit by this hurricane that I just kind of made reference to where it's like it's just affecting the heat and humidity for us. But I know you guys are really hard hit by it. And I hope that, you know, people are recovering well. Um, you know, hot, humid climate seems the hot, humid climate seem to be the trickiest ones, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, so many things like it, it kind of, it, it stifles, it make, makes things more difficult. I mean, there are a lot of things that have been uh, employed. Um, and I think this is where, um, you know, some of these things like, you know, typically doing a lot more in terms of air movement helps. Um, and so I think this is where, when you look at traditional buildings from hot, humid climates, you see things that are thinner materials. So you're not capturing and retaining the heat, allowing the airflow to airflow allowing some ways to get some shade but you know I mean there's also a limit to that and I and I worry you know I mean really it comes down to like that threshold of habitability is not the direct temperature but it's the dew point temperature so it's the heat and humidity combined <laughs> excuse me but you know a lot of things that I find that I've been finding you know a lot of it comes down to the site beyond just the building and so this is where things like vegetation are incredibly important. You know, there's also the the, the psychological aspects, but you know, because we are animals after all, we are part of the natural world. But the fact that uh, buildings uh, that that vegetation can cool the 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 air so much for from shading and evapotranspiration and all of these things, um, I think that that is a huge one. Um, and resilience and you know and I think this comes into some of the resilience stuff that I was starting to touch upon at the very end you know it's like we have done a number to our to our environments I mean like you know all, all the effects of uh, the flooding that you guys had a few years ago because your bayous were so backed up to the point where when you got I don't know sorry I don't remember which hurricane that one was where you got just dumped with like several feet of water Harvey it was, that hurricane was Harvey. Harvey thank yeah. you um but it just you know it's we don't live in, you know, we are, everything that we're doing is connected. And I think the more we're aware of that and the more we try to re, uh, restore the natural habitats and the natural parts of the ecosystems that we've kind of monkeyed with, like slowing down the river so that they can actually flow, so they can actually absorb things, re remove a lot of our, we have way too much uh, impermeable way too many impermeable surfaces so when when you do get the rain it hits it and it can't absorb and then it just runs off to the point where it's eroding things and and it doesn't absorb back into the water which is also depleting our our groundwater aquifers um the fact that you know we've gotten rid of so many of the wetlands like oh this is just swampy land let's get rid of this no this is actually a buffer this is our lungs or kidneys or something. i mean but it's doing a lot in terms of making that happen the fact that the mangroves have been destroyed in a lot of places i think all along miami beach at one you know 100 years ago they're like these are ugly let's rip them out we want the white sand beaches well guess what that protects the erosion which that then protects that the houses that are built or the, the buildings that are happening you know that are built further inland and all of these pieces all together let alone all the ecosystem issues and the water quality and all of these pieces but I think a lot of it is really paying more attention to what our actual environments are and listening to it and and maybe having some more humility on on you know on this the way our human cultural influences are on things where we go in and, and, and I'm emphasizing the cultural part because that's not the case for everybody and I recognize that but in our dominant culture in the U.S. at least we tend to go in and just kind of flatten things and and not pay attention to what's going on and I think there's a there's a huge amount that's lost with that and some of our results a ton of our resilience has been lost with that um but I think you know and then and then it comes down to you know, there's the slowing, slowing the um, climate change, and we're getting it to, to the point where we can get it back uh, down, which is going to take a long time, but slowing that progression first, and then slow, you know, but then also at the same time, how do we deal with the pieces in the meantime? And, you know, I think the heat and humidity part is a real concern. I mean, it's a huge concern. And, and as much as I don't like being in air conditioning, I think there's right now, I, you know, there are times where it's really it's dangerous for people and so then it's maybe is upon us as building professionals and as our you know 
mechanical engineering counterparts and all the people within our related fields to find more efficient ways of doing that. And a lot of things are going towards heat pumps as opposed to heaters and things like that. Uh, but, but then we as architects have relinquished an awful lot of this uh, over the last hundred years, you know, with this era of cheap fuel, like when the first commercial air conditioners were put in, the first one in San Antonio was in the 1920s. We've kind of relinquished stuff. We're just like, okay, fine, whatever, seal up the, the, the building done, as opposed to thinking about it in a layered approach. How do we like make sure we have enough vegetation, make sure we have enough shading, get some shading onto things, have lighter colors, have materials that are that are functioning correctly in your in your um environment and all of those pieces together i don't think there's a it's a single thing that's a, the solution it's all of these pieces together each one can help with it understanding how the airflow works you know i mean buildings aren't static things you know there's a certain amount of like understanding when and where you open windows and how to how to create a stack effect to suck the cool hot the the cool air in and spit the hot air out hot air rises work with the physics of all of that um yeah, I, I I don't I don't have a one size fits all answer. I think it's a really a combination of all of these different pieces and probably so many more that I haven't even come up with yet as I'm collecting these. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. A very sensible answer. I think um, we have to emphasize the thing that we are not alone. We are, this is not the human's planet only. Right. So let's try to live in harmony with the rest of us. Uh, Mr. Brown has a question. Are you still with us? Air Brown? I'm indeed. Yes. Thank you very much, Corey, for a very interesting and insightful talk. I think it's it's easy and tempting to look at the idea of buildings and architecture in isolation, a building. But how do you foresee, you know, assuming this sort of move back to more let's call them traditional methods? gains traction, how that will affect the idea of population density and community. I mean, the, you know, the, the idea that suburbs were a, a uniquely 20th century idea that, you know, you wouldn't probably attempt under other circumstances. I, I don't think it's new, but um, yeah. How do you foresee maybe a, a town central main street differing this time in 30 years? Hmm. Thank you for that. That's a great question. And I think, you know, I think part of that comes down to making sure that we, we are all collectively talking about all of these different pieces. I think one part of it is that that uh, urban planning is a really important piece of it. Yes, we we are becoming a more urban species. You know, I don't remember, it wasn't that long ago that we reached that tipping point where I think over half of half of half of people are now living in cities. Mm. In some ways, there's a there's a benefit to, I mean, there are a lot of ways there's a benefit to that. It's a shift. But the fact that if it means each person, you know, it's like by by us living more densely and the social aspects that that we can gain from that, it also means that we are not sprawling and taking over space that really should be used for other things, right? There's a there's a different sensibility of, of the way we build but I mean really in some ways that's not that's not new it's just that it's more dense but you know up until we had um vehicular transportation of like automobiles and even trains before that I mean there were you know transit suburbs and things but really it was with the advent of the car that people were like oh I can go however many miles away it's great I can get back in 20 minutes and suddenly we just sprawled because we could and, but those walkable communities, the things that were really developed over centuries, just, you know, that's, if you're going to live in an area, like you're going to have, it's going to be walkable because it has to be. But there are pieces of that that work. That said, you know, I think there are also in a lot of pieces where it's like, if we are investing in the quality of life in a more urban setting, I think there's an awful lot to be done there. You know, I, I've noticed, I've been really marveling recently about some of the things that have really been developing in New York City in the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. But I mean, some pieces like there, there, there have been pieces of the city that I live in that I haven't been back to in five years. I wasn't there since before COVID. And, you know, I went back again. I'm like, oh my God, it's so much better. It's like there, there are places where, you know, we have been investing a lot. I mean, we've got a long way to, catch, to do to catch up to a lot of places in Europe with this, but like we've been putting in so many more bike lanes. I can now bike into work in a way that I'd 
felt like I was taking my life into my hands before. But there are also a lot more street trees. There are a lot of paths that now, you know, when you first plant them, there's these cute little things. And now there's actually a canopy. And I notice, like you notice a difference, like going through, you're the hot sun. And this, and then suddenly you're like, ooh, did you get a nice breeze coming through the trees and it's shaded and it's lovely. And there are these places where we're developing these pockets within the within the city that are just beautiful and hadn't been like this before. And, you know, New York is not alone in that. I mean, New York has kind of had its own interesting history that's like super, super urban by some perspectives. And, you know, uh, and and but it there's a lot that's being done right now. And I think that's the case in a lot of places that you know, and we have a lot of examples all over the world that we can look to, to say what works and what doesn't. And I think that's something that we all as, as designers, as architects, as heritage professionals, as anybody, as people on this planet, we all have experienced different things in the world. What works, what doesn't? We don't need to reinvent the wheel so much as learn from each other. And that doesn't necessarily mean learning from the past, although that's a huge part of it. It doesn't necessarily mean learning from right now. That's a huge, but I mean, it's like, let's look at the whole thing as a continuum. We are all, you know, we've had a lot of things that we've figured out as, a, you know, wisdom over the years all around. Let's learn from what works and let's learn from what doesn't and how to improve it. And I think that can go, that goes across the spectrum. That's not necessarily a heritage thing. That's an everything thing. And so I think there's a lot to be, to really to be desired about the way we do, do. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to the way the opportunities that we have in urban places um, and things that we can do to make um, rural places more comfortable like uh, and everywhere but I think I think given that half of half of the world's population rate and more than the world more than half the world's population is in urban settings now it really behooves us to spend a lot of time working with that and that's heritage and urban planning and landscape designing and all of the other pieces that go together. Is that maybe a non-answer? No, 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 that was great. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have another two questions. First from Howard, if Howard would like to. Yes, um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. And your question is exactly what I would like to ask as well. So uh, can you ask really... the question? Yeah, thank you for your talk, which is excellent presentation of all the issues, and I really like the kind of philosophy and so on. But have you got an an example of act, actually how? I mean, I I gather from your slides that you work for big architectural practice. But I mean, I that's a question as well. But do you have any examples of where you've been able to put any of this uh, philosophy into practice? Like modification to heritage or other buildings to yes. improve per performance with the techniques you presented. Oh, we lost our speaker. Oops, I need to mute. Where is our speaker? I don't know. <laughs> That's odd. Cory, are you with us? Are you still with us? Probably she lost connection. I hope she's coming back. I don't know what happened. Yes, I don't know what to say. I hope she's coming back. Let's wait for her a bit. Maybe she has some connection problems. What shall we do? Shall we stop here or we are waiting for the speaker to come back? Oh, that's very unexpected. In any case, if you have more questions, you can send her to her email. I hope she let, let it in the presentation. If not, you can send us to us, to admin email address, and we will send it forward. Please share her email. 
Oh, yes, I will do it right away. Just a moment. Have to find it. I will send her email to all the participants on the Zoom meeting because I have your addresses and you can ask her directly. Otherwise, I have to. Is she back? No. Yes, she is. Is she? Oh, hello. Welcome back. You are, you are, we cannot hear you. Please unmute, unmute your. Uh, unmute. We cannot hear you. We see you, but we cannot hear you. Uh, we cannot hear you. I don't know, maybe the way she connected, but we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Hello. Now, now it's okay. fine. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm going to, let's see if I can now turn off my video and I'm just going to talk. Um... Oh, sorry. Um... Don't worry. It's good that you came back. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. My my computer decided to freeze on me. Um, okay. But it's fine. You can answer. Okay. We don't see you now. Okay, great. Oh, maybe Just I gonna... have to make you co-host again. No. No, no, no. I'm trying to turn off my phone so that I can so I turn off the, that part so I can go to not... Uh... <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I guess I'm going to do this. We can, we can keep talking while I figure out how to take, take it off of speaker so I'm not bothering the rest of my office. So. I see. So can you answer to Howard's question? If you have some examples of applying those principles to an existing heritage building, how you modify it to reach better parameters? I'm sorry, could you repeat the full question? So the question was if you have some samples of your practical samples of some projects of yours when you applied those principles to some heritage buildings. Yes. Um, so for, for one example, um, I worked on a on a the restoration of a court courthouse a number of years ago, and it has really tall. It, uh, tall windows and um, it's on the sidewalk it was on the north side of a of a street and you know they were all of the if we went back and looked to what the building looked like when it was first constructed that sidewalk had a whole bunch of trees going across it that, that were shading it was providing a lot of shade to the building and so we were able to, because it was a heritage building, we were able to demonstrate to the local landmarks commission that that was there before. And that's really important to bring back. And they, and the, um, you know, the client were all on board with like, well, yeah, let's, let's restore that. And, um, and, and in doing so, not only does it make it nicer, but it actually reduced some of the load on the mechanical equipment because you, it wasn't cooking all summer long from the, from the south sun coming in and beating into the, into these large windows. Um, it's a small one. Um, I, <sighs> I'm sorry. I think I'm drawing some blanks at the moment, which I shouldn't. I think I'm just suddenly frazzled after all of all of that. Um, the, you know, we've worked. I've worked on uh, projects where, um, uh, you know, we found that there was a there was originally a, um, you know, looking back at what the what the color palette was, and we discovered that the color palette for a house that was intent initially used as a summer house had a very light, uh, light yellow and light white coloring. Like the, the paint was a very light color, which helped reflect things. In fact, we found that even up on the roof, well before the, you know, 200 years before the things that we're doing now in terms of membrane roofs that need to be light colors. This was, this was something that was, it was a wood shingle roof that had 
uh, a light color paint on it to help to reflect things. Um, we've I've done a lot of things where we're understanding where, you know, how the how the ventilation worked in the windows and windows that had previously been sealed shut. We were open to, able to open those windows back up again. Um, I have better examples, but I think does does that help at all? Oh, I do have another one for you. So I worked on a cathedral a number of years ago. It was built 200 and some odd years ago. And it originally at the crossing, there was a dome at the top and there was, um, and there were 24 skylights with operable, operable skylights. And over the years that you know, a lot of that had been sealed up in World War II, they, they covered over, they got rid of those skylights and covered over the whole thing because they didn't want light shining up through these 24 skylights in the, in the, in the ceiling at that point in time. Uh, we were able to go back and look at all of that and understand and reconstruct those skylights which brought in uh, brought in a lot of beautiful daylight streaming right into the crossing at the uh, at the middle of the cathedral. But also, we were able to use that as part of our um, uh, heating and cooling strategy. So they were operable, but we were also able to put in so some um, some ventilation up at that within that dome, and that the heating system, heating and cooling system, we were able to put in as underfloor. Uh, an underfloor system that had vents that were coming up right right under the pews. You know, a, a, a cathedral is huge, right? You don't want to be conditioning 70 feet of, however many meters that is, uh, you don't want to be heating several stories of space all at, at once when you really just need like the six feet or like two or three meters or so, um, so that anybody, two meters, uh, so that anybody in that habitable space can, can is, is comfortable. And so what we did is in the, we, we conditioned everything below the, the pews and then it was set up so that, uh, you know, hot air would in the winter time and the summertime, the hot air would rise and rise away from people. You had all that extra height to do so. And we could draw it out at, of that dome. And in the colder winter months, we had heaters up at the top that kind of helped stop that heat from rising because it kind of created a buffer and padded it, push it back down again. So that that heating that also, you know, was, it had vents, but it also was heating the floor space itself so that, that when you're touching that floor, it's convective, uh, conductive heat rather than just the radiant heat. Um, yeah, but I mean, there are a number of cases where we've thought about the way the building physics works to actually make it more habitable. Um, and, and again, you know, it, my office does an awful lot of work where we're working with passive house strategies. So we're looking at how to effectively insulate, how to effectively air seal in a way that's um, compatible with and, and uh, uh, sensitive to, an ex to a historic building um, and what types of, of uh, mechanical systems that go with that. And that shrinks that down considerably. So you're not using these huge ducts and things that you would in a more conventional system. Thank you very much. Your answer only show us that we always have to look to the bigger picture and the building, it's not only the building itself, but also the environment around as the example with the trees, which are not an architectural element, but help so much. Uh, we have two more questions. We have one from Anne, who is unable to speak, so I will try to read her text. So she said that she owns a historic building, so completely understand the importance of building regionally. However, what about lack of access to appropriate materials and cost in a world where Lowy and Home Depot dominate? Custom construction for new buildings is incredibly expensive. Also, the quality of materials like lumber, it's often poor and stone mansory and lime are difficult to source and have exorbitant costs. In other words, how can this attention to appropriateness scale? Uh, meaning, can we find cheaper ways of doing, having the same results? That is an ongoing question in preservation, certainly. Um, I would... For starters, I would direct you to in the U.S. the um, the um, the preservation briefs from the National Park Service. There was a new preservation brief that was uh, published about a year ago, really looking at um, uh, alternative materials and uh, the Association for Preservation Technology, or APT, the 
uh, URL is apti.org. Um, we put to, we put on a symposium related to, to these very topics. Um, and in fact, with any of these, reach out to me afterwards. I'm happy to send you links to, to all of these things. Um, but, you know, um, substitute materials is always kind of an interesting question um, from a number of perspectives, from a pedagogical one, but also a performance one. And, and now in terms of, of uh, cost and carbon cost and a number of different things, uh, there are a lot of things that have been, there are good ways to approach some of these and it depends on what you're trying to replace. It depends on how it's being used and it depends on what's available um, and how you go about that. So I, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk further, you know, about maybe more specifics only because like anything, I think a sweeping generality gets a little complicated. Um, but yes, there are an awful lot of places where this is a very, you know, it's a very critical question. Um, you know, and, and some of this, you're right. There are some materials that just aren't available anymore. You know, for us, you know, we use, you know, in, in New York city, there used to be an awful lot of brownstone that was used, uh, in a lot of our buildings that is not a very durable material, especially the way it was used, but those quarries have also closed. And so there, that's not readily available. In fact, when we are replicating something, if we are going back with brownstone, we'll use, we will very often source brownstone from Scotland, which really funny enough not is the same vein, <laughs> same vein of stone, right? But, but, you know, from the sustainability perspective, there are a couple of pieces. One, by using a few pieces of things rather than completely redo a building, there's that. But there's also there's a lot of discussion right now about about the sustainability and the, the embodied the upfront carbon cost of stone versus concrete concrete where you take stone break it down and then reconstitute it again to make stone um there's a lot of conversation that's happening with that right now but there are you know sometimes that's the appropriate way of doing things sometimes what's more appropriate is to use cast stone in uh to replicate it or you know it really depends on the on the uh purpose um, and there are a couple other materials that that can be used as well, but it really depends on what and where and why. Um, but you know, the first thing is that you're hanging on to the building and only replacing what needs to be replaced or repairing it. And sometimes it's more of a matter of repairing what's there. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to start going down too much of another rabbit hole there. Um, but but there are this is an ongoing conversation and there are a lot, a lot of different options available and you sometimes have to be very you, you always have to be very thoughtful but sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative than others in terms of what is available and what is appropriate um i'm happy to talk more about any details with that um yes i about any any email address i okay thank you so in this case who else have questions can email her directly we still have a question from Thomas about Okay. Thomas, are you still here? Please unmute and ask your question directly. And the last one about the education, I can say that uh, Raza it's asking, how do you think ad architectural education needs to change, if at all? Of course, it has to change a lot. And this is an ongoing uh, conversation, how we build, bring back builders with architects and all the crafts, because now there is quite an odd situation. But for that, you can listen to our February talk when we talk about summer schools and how can we promote this traditional architecture type of learning. So Thomas, please. Thank you. So my question is about a sustainability law that France uh, introduced. It was um, President Macron um, announced it in 2020 that all new public buildings in France need to be made 50% of wood or similar sorts okay. of materials. And it's really a question, you know, to what extent are um, should we mandate uh, innovative and new solutions to sustainability problems? And to what extent should we look to um, traditional solutions? And one of the issues with this is that France's traditional architecture is mostly stone and brick. So by doing that, okay. that stops uh, vernacular buildings from being constructed. Okay, excellent question. I, I think, you know, part of that ends up coming down to whether we're talking about performance versus prescriptive 
codes. And it sounds like this one is a prescriptive rather than a performance, right? So rather than just saying, we don't care exactly how it's done, you just need to, need to meet these targets versus these are the materials you need to use. And they are different things, right? Um, and, you know, depending, and I know that there are generally several reasons for selecting one versus the other. Um, but I think, you know, maybe more on the pedagogical side, I guess, there's that question of what is, you know, what is a contemporary building? What is a, you know, and I'm not talking stylistically, I'm talking about like our purposes right now and what are you using a building for? And um, and what what is actually needed in that context? And I think when we start talking about the durability of buildings and materials and things, I think when you start looking at things over the life cycle value of carbon and of, of your buildings, I think that starts shifting the equation. Um, I also, sorry, there was something else I was going to say with that. I don't remember what now. I'm, I'm talking to you while I'm trying to actually pull this back up so I can get back onto my computer to talk to you directly. Um, but yeah, I think part of it is the performance versus prescriptive version. Oh, hold on. I'm going to hang up here and get back. Hold on. Let me see if this works. Hello. This was working. Oh, okay. This better. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And I apologize for my technical difficulties today. Um, so yeah, performance versus pres prescriptive um, ways of going about things. I think, you know, maybe that's where some of that conversation needs to happen. Um, and I think there's also the difference between hanging on to an existing building versus building a new one. But there's also, you know, I would also encourage all of you, if you are not already following him, to follow uh, Lloyd Alter. He's a he's a professor and an architect um, based in Toronto. Um, he's been talking an awful lot about a number of these issues, including just the idea of of um, sufficiency. So it's not just, you know, we can talk about um, how much like how much do we actually need and do we need you know what what is appropriate for what we're looking for versus what you know and and some of the things he talks about is things like why have our vehicles gotten so huge in north america why are people driving these monster trucks where a truck that's like this size can do the same thing and the same thing with like the size of houses that people have have you know in, in this country at least have been well, us and canada you know where our the size of our housing you know area per person has really exploded in the 20th century. Um, oh yeah, Lloyd, oh, let me see if I can do this now. Okay, this Lloyd Alter. I asked Corey to type yes. his name on the chat. So we there can we go. See, yes. Um, but I do do encourage you to to, to uh, list, uh, look him up and, and read some of the things that he's been discussing. He has a new book that's come out recently, but um, he's got a lot of really, you know, big picture thinking that addresses a lot of these things. And so some of this comes down to like, let's talk big picture about what are our big goals? What are the big picture ways of going about it? And then let's get into the weeds of how to make that happen. And some of this, you know, I think it's amazing that we're now talking about um, uh, low carbon materials, carbon sequestering materials. But in some ways that's actually come full circle a couple of times. I remember like in the early 2000s, we were talking about it from an energy perspective. Oh, that's it. Well, let's build everything everything out of wood. Well, that's all wonderful. But if you're living in somewhere like New York, that's very dense, you also need to worry about fire. You also need to worry about, oh, that's right. That's why we did this before. And we just keep going in circles. I think each time we go in a circle, we learn a little bit more. I'd like to think, I'd like to hope. But you know everything has a context, and you know the like that slide that I had where I was showing a picture of a granite base with a limestone, you know above it. You know we don't need to use the most durable materials in every location. We don't need to use the most expensive materials in every location. But we also need to make sure that where we need that durability, that we are. Um, you know at the at the risk of drawing the ire of anybody who's really into like you know, interior design stuff. The idea of granite countertops drives me crazy. 
conceptually, right? You're taking a very durable material. You're taking, you're cutting it into this funny shape, putting it in a place where potentially in 10 years, someone's going to say, I'm tired of this. This is passe. This isn't my style anymore and ripping it out. Why? If you're going to do something that's going to have like a 10 year, 20 year, whatever time frame before somebody gets just tired of it, not that it doesn't work anymore, but you're tired of it or you want to reconfigure something, use the material that's going to last thousands of, you know, hundreds of years. If you're building, but doing something in a location where you need something to last hundreds of years, use those materials there. I think we really, there's this weird disconnect that we've developed between what's needed and what's not. And, and, you know, we're, we're doing this weird disconnect where things aren't quite aligning there. Um, I think it's Stuart Rand. I'm going to take his name in and I hope I'm not, I hope I'm quoting, citing the right person who wrote this book about, about the, um, how buildings work. And so there are these different layers where like the structure of the building needs to last for hundreds of years. The interior finish maybe is going to last for 10. And, you know, because one is dealing with fashion, one is dealing with, with keeping the building upright and they have different time periods. And so you, when you're really getting down to it, think about what materials you're using and where. And so that also includes the high carbon materials. They're places where you need that, where they, the material intensive or the, you know, things like that, um, you know, use the copper for the flashing under a slate roof that's gonna last for 150 years, rather than some fancy little thing that you're just gonna get rid of and throw out. Or, you know, do things where if you need a composite material that you're not going to be able to pull apart afterwards or anything, first of all, think about whether that's actually needed. Second of all, if you're going to use that, use that in a place that it really or you're, you're providing something meaningful for it. You know, I, I think maybe the flip side of, well, it's not the flip side. I mean, it's also, you know, that granite countertop idea. There's also the things like, why are we using so much single use plastic? Or why are we using so much plastic in our buildings to begin with? You know, all of these things, we're using materials that last forever in places that we don't want them to last forever, or things that we want to that are going to deter deteriorate rather, whether or not we can reuse them or not. I think there's a, there's a disconnect between our material selections and their use. And I think I'm really glad that some of these conversations are happening, um, you know, like what these, it sounds like these mandates that are starting to happen in France. Um, I think even mandates foster conversation and hopefully if they're good intention, then there are places where you can push back where it does and does not make sense. But you also need to question on your own, does this in fact, it, it, does my argument make sense? And think ultimately what the big picture purposes for it. Thank you so much, Corey. I think if we want to conclude your talk is that practically we have to go back to common sense and to a sort of, how to say, self-awareness and not very greedy to know our limits because we are living in a world of limited resources right. and um, in the possibility, which is not unlikely that our resources will go out we will have to relearn to live with more modest means and if we stay in a very nice i don't know 23 degrees will be very difficult then right <laughs> to go back outside and hunt for our food or stuff like this in the most um, apocalyptic scenarios but hopefully not the case and to be and and to be fair with that, I'm not saying oh we need to all go to austerity anything. It's more of a thinking thoughtfully for what we actually need. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating here, um, it was happening before the pandemic, but it kind of happened even more so during the pandemic when everybody was suddenly at home and they're like, you know, it's like I've acquired so much clutter because I've been it's been conditioned into my head that I need to go and buy more and more and more stuff. And, you know, not me personally necessarily. Well, yes, but I mean, we all do. And I've got too much clutter. But like we as a society have been conditioned to say we need to buy and we need to get more stuff all the time to the point where then then you're like, no, actually, I would be happier if I didn't have all this, if instead I did things thoughtfully. And so it's not a matter of austerity, but a matter of thoughtfulness okay. and what actually provides happiness, what actually what actually makes you comfortable, what actually brings joy to your life, what, how, and how can you maybe, are, are there different ways, better ways to be thoughtful about living your life? And 
living where you live and how you live and, and all the pieces. It, it all ultimately goes together. And I think we've just, from a big picture systemic perspective, I think we've gotten into some, you know, there have been some amazing things that have happened, but there are also, I think our whole system could stand some reconsideration. Yes, we lost a bit of balance. Thank you right. so much, Corey, for this extremely interesting and informing talk. And all of you that remain with us and those who, oh, Mr. Brown has another question, but then we will wrap. Please unmute your microphone. No, no, I was clapping. Oh, oh you are clapping. clapping oh, fantastic. Yes. Thank so you. Thank you. You agree. Thank you very much, Corey. <laughs> So, thank you, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Yes, but... we will have a break on August. We will not have a tag, tag talk, but maybe we will organize something else outside in the nature to connect ourselves with Mother Nature. And I hope to see you back in September for a new tag talk, as I mentioned before, with Eta Remazzola from Notre Dame University, Rome Gateway. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.